Hello again. In our past talks, uh, we saw how animals can settle fights. And now I'd like to talk about the most interesting enigma of them all. Why are animals so, often so very nice to one another, even at very high cost to themselves? Uh, Darwin worried about this quite a lot and uh, how it could be explained. Well, although the contests of evolution take place at the level of the individual organism, we might ask who are the ultimate contestants in the game. Uh, after all, the contest for reproductive success for the individual is played out only in one lifetime for that individual, and then the individual is gone long before the game itself ends. However, the strategy of that successful individual lives on to fight further contests in the genes of the successful contestant's offspring. The winners and losers are ultimately genes, genes of strategy, not individuals. It's dark and selfish gene. So since relatives share a proportion of the same genes as yourself, it's just as good for a close relative to win a contest as you yourself, if only the appropriate number of relatives win instead of you. Uh, Haldane jokingly uh, stated this when he quipped, I'd lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. Uh, Bill Hamilton, rather than treating this as a matter of uh, amusing observation, vastly expanded this in his concept of kin selection and quantified it in Hamilton's Law, which essentially states that the cost-benefit ratio uh, in a contest is directly related to kinship. And what this means in evolutionary game theory is, is that in kin-involved games, we've got to weigh the payoffs of the game according to the relatedness of certain other players, our kin. And this kin selection is the very beginning of altruism. This is why animals will risk their own welfare to protect others in their kin group. Well, I'm sure we all recognize that we've seen kin selection in action in almost all social animals. But uh, I think we also have to admit that uh, many of the instances of altruism that we see in nature are not just between kin. They extend to a wider group of associated animals. Uh, and things like mutual grooming or sharing resources, mutual defense, uh, cooperative child rearing, and uh, uh, many, many social animals. And how does this all come uh, about if kin selection is the main driver? And the solution to this rather interesting question uh, comes about from uh, analyzing whether animals ought to cooperate with one another or should defect from cooperation. And the game that uh, absolutely illustrates the dilemma of whether to cooperate or uh, whether to defect is in the game uh, which is known as the prisoner's dilemma. It epitomizes the problems of cooperation versus defection. And the story in the prisoner's dilemma situation is that you and your partner are arrested for a crime that you've both committed and you've promised each other that you'll stay stumm. That means you'll be loyal in British slang. Uh, if this situation of arrest ever occurs, you'll cooperate with one another. Uh, but you're separated by the police and you're interrogated in separate cells and you're offered a deal uh, by the prosecution. It's the same deal, it's a symmetrical game. And you're tempted to defect from your pledge. Temptation is even greater if your partner in crime is still loyal to you because the payoff is going to be that much better. That's the pink area of this payoff graph. You also worry uh, what happens if you do cooperate and your partner defects? You then get yourself into a terrible situation which is known as the sucker's payoff, the worst possible payoff or penalty of all. So you always defect. You defect if your partner defects and you defect if your partner stays loyal. And both of you are looking at this deal and you both end up by defecting. And the interesting thing about both of you defecting is you get a worse payoff than you would have ever got if you had both cooperated with each other as you originally planned. And that's the charm and the beauty of the dilemma that is Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, you might ask, is there a better solution to Prisoner's Dilemma from a game theory point of view, from the mathematics that you get? And the answer is no. 
in a single round game, there is no better strategy than defection. If the Prisoner's Dilemma game is played repeatedly, you meet again and again, and the situation changes totally. The payoff for defection is still high, but the other player can repeatedly reward you to not defect and punish you when you do defect. And so you need to study the options available and strategies of cooperation in this repeated Prisoner's Dilemma game. Now, Robert Axelrod, a political scientist, uh, was thinking about this problem, and what Axelrod did is propose a contest. Who could come up with the best strategy for playing repeated Prisoner's Dilemma? He invited some well-known game theoreticians, mathematicians, and evolutionary scientists to come up with uh, different strategies that could be played. All of these strategies were written up as computer programs and pitted against one another in a great tournament. And the contest was won by Anatole Rapoport, who submitted one of the simplest strategies of all, a strategy known as tit-for-tat. In tit-for-tat, you start by cooperating, and then you just echo your opponent's last move, rewarding his cooperation and punishing his defections. It's a simple strategy, but one with great implications. This winning tit-for-tat strategy is essentially the old rule, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. Tit-for-tat strategies are found in many instances in nature, and it's known as direct reciprocity. Uh, two animals are directly interchanging favors and cooperating with one another in some task. And the example I'm showing is in a fish known as a stickleback that has to explore a rather dangerous environment uh, where predator pikes live, and they do it as cooperating pairs. Now let's go on to indirect reciprocity. What happens when the participant who must reward you is not the same one that you originally gave a resource to and has no kin relationship to you? How can you avoid defection then? Instead of direct reciprocity, which is I'll scratch your back and you scratch mine, indirect reciprocity works like this. I'll scratch Fred's back, Fred scratches Sam's back, Sam scratches George's back, and then maybe George will scratch my back. Well, you kind of feel that complicated sort of system can't work, and the mathematics says it can't. However, there is a possible solution. If we introduce into the mathematical game the element of reputation, which is a measure of how a player has behaved in the past, the cooperative strategies again become dominant. It's been shown that a variant of Hamilton's kin selection rule is in effect. Instead of kinship, it involves the probability of knowing the reputation of another player rather than the ratio of kin relatedness. Reputation measurement certainly requires higher level of cognition for the species practicing it. Indirect reciprocity is found in a number of animals, of course, higher cognitive animals, the example here being vampire bats. Evolutionary game theory has games where players can communicate with each other during the game. Uh, these are games where signaling is involved. The objective for the sender is to manipulate the receiver such that the sender achieves its particular objectives, uh, say mating. Uh, the receiver also is a player in the game and is trying to win its own objectives say, uh, in this case, uh, the selection of a superior male mate. And the issue becomes one of truth and communications for the female, uh, and perhaps the intentional deception of the female by the male. So it sounds very familiar in mating. Uh, the mechanism that sorts this all out mathematically is the handicap principle proposed by Zahavi and Grafen, uh, where it can be mathematically shown that for a superior male, uh, it's a very good strategy to make an especially costly display which is unaffordable uh, by a liar or a less superior male. In a similar fashion, uh, a gazelle in the savannas exhibit a bounding energetic leap uh, to tell potential predators that there's no point in stalking them uh, because they're much more capable and fit for escaping. Anyhow, this mathematics is in essence a variation of Hamilton's modified law. In other words, in the area of signaling, it pays for an animal to establish a reputation for honesty and communication. 
So many of the things that we think of as good in moral terms is really nothing more than something that's rather good in mathematical terms.